Muy buenos días a todas las personas presentes el día de hoy. Doy hoy por inaugurada la audiencia número 18 del 185 periodo ordinario de sesiones de la CIDH. Regular period of sessions of the ITHR, which is entitled Precautionary Measures, Detainees in Guantanamo Bay with regard to the United States, which was requested ex officio by the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. My name is Estuardo Ralón. I'm the first vice president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And today with me are Commissioner Joel Hernandez, Rapporteur for Human Mobility, Commissioner Margaret May Macaulay, second vice president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and Rapporteur for the Rights of Afro-Descendants and Against Racial Discrimination, and Commissioner Roberta Clark, Rapporteur on the Rights of, persons, of LGBTI Persons and Country Rapporteur for the United States. I would like to greet the representatives of the state and the organizations representing the beneficiaries of the precautionary measures. In addition, I would like to explain how we will be distributing time during this hearing. Initially, we will give 20 minutes so that the representatives of the beneficiaries of the precautionary measures can present. Then the state will have 20 minutes to express its points of view then the commission will have 20 minutes for its comments and then we will give the floor back to the representatives of the beneficiaries of the precautionary measures and to the state for 12 minutes each and then the commission will have six minutes to wrap up i would like to thank you for being here today and let's I start with the hearing. I would like to give the floor to the representatives of the beneficiaries of the precautionary measures for 20 minutes. Good morning, distinguished commissioners, representatives of the United States, and members of the public. My name is Helen Kerwin, lawyer at the Center for Justice and International Law, Sahil. I am accompanied by Wells Dixon and Alia Hussein from the Center for Constitutional Rights, CCR, and Francisco Quintana and Patricia Cruz Marin from Sahil. We thank the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for convening this essential hearing on the ongoing situation in the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. We also thank the distinguished representatives of the United States for their participation. Sahil and CCR have represented, represented the beneficiaries of these precautionary measures for more than 20 years since we requested them in early 2002 after the opening of the center. The closure of Guantanamo Bay continues to be a matter of enormous national, regional, and global importance. And we thank the Inter-American Commission for providing such an important forum to discuss these issues publicly. The Inter-American Commission has played a key role in international oversight of the prison throughout the last two decades, issuing collective precautionary measures for all of the prisoners there detained, precautionary measures in favor of particular prisoners, resolutions, as well as a thematic report calling for the immediate closure of Guantanamo, a merits report in the case of Jamel Amesian, 12 hearings, including this one, and countless requests for on-site visits, which the state has not yet granted in, in adequate conditions. Yet notwithstanding the, the gravity of the torture, abuse, indefinite detention, due process violations, and other violations that this commission has already conclusively decided occur at Guantanamo, as we speak, 36 prisoners remain detained there. 22 of them, moreover, are already cleared for transfer, meaning that the US agrees that they should not be detained, yet they continue to be held indefinitely. With the election of President Biden, we had hoped that the transfers, which were virtually halted under the previous administration, would be restarted and cleared Guantanamo detainees would be expeditiously transferred to their home countries or to third countries, ultimately permitting the closure of the prison. However, to date, there has been little progress. In 2013, this commission issued a, a, an additional precautionary res measures resolution in which it ordered the United States to first, immediately close the prison, second, transfer the detainees while ensuring respect for their human rights and particularly the obligation of non refoulement third, release the detainees who are cleared for transfer, and fourth, ensure adequate detention conditions and due process rights for the remaining detainees. As Attorney Wells Dixon will now address in further detail, the United States remains in evident noncompliance with every point of the 2013 precautionary orders measure, precautionary measures order. I, I will pass it now to uh, Wells Dixon. 
Thank you and good morning. I'm Wells Dixon from the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York, and I represent detainees at Guantanamo. I want to begin by thanking uh, the commission and the state and the members of the public for the opportunity to address you this morning on behalf of those men who remain in Guantanamo indefinitely and without due process of law. I am mindful of the fact that this is not the first time uh, that I've appeared before this commission to address these issues uh, of Guantanamo. As my colleague uh, has pointed out, uh, we've been doing this now for um, two decades. And I wanna thank the commission for its continued engagement on these issues over that period of time, and specifically for the continuing push to close the prison at Guantanamo. And I will acknowledge that there has been some progress in achieving that objective. Today, there are 36 men who remain, most of whom are approved for transfer. Uh, that's down from uh, a total population of about 800. And uh, I would also, excuse me, acknowledge uh, uh, and I appreciate the continuing commitment of the Biden administration to achieve closure of the prison and to show greater respect for human rights and the rule of law. And last, um, I acknowledge uh, the renewed efforts within the US State Department to transfer detainees. Uh, those renewed efforts began in April with the appointment of a deputy counterterrorism coordinator and have continued with the appointment of an ambassador in the Guantanamo Affairs Unit. Um, we, uh, as, as petitioners, had asked for the appointment of an envoy, that is the reappointment of an envoy to, to lead transfer negotiations and uh, the appointment of uh, the new ambassador has essentially uh, fulfilled that request. So we appreciate uh, and, and thank the state for that. But as the state is likely to agree with us, uh, none of this is an adequate substitute for actual transfers or closure of the prison. And the men who remain there have heard a lot of these commitments before and have waited uh, long enough for their transfer out of the prison. The time for talking about these issues is over and the time, uh, we are well past the time to act and to finally achieve closure of the prison. Now I'll note that Guantanamo arose more than 20 years ago in the wake of the September 11th attacks and the US invasion of Afghanistan and that war has now ended. At least the U.S. involvement in the war in Afghanistan has largely ended. And yet the detention of these men at Guantanamo persists and persists without end. Now, in recent years, the United States has pursued efforts to review the detainees at Guantanamo again and again and again to determine their suitability for transfer. And at this point, just about every detainee who is not currently charged before a military commission has been approved to leave the prison. I think there are only three individuals who are neither charged nor approved to leave. And that is certainly a welcome development. Uh, we appreciate those efforts, but that is not without more an effective closure strategy. I'll note by way of example that there are three men in Guantanamo who were approved for transfer in 2010, more than a decade ago, yet they continue to be held. I note that one detainee, uh, former detainee who has completed a military commission sentence has now been held a year beyond his sentencing. I mentioned this because it underscores a fundamental point and that is that the rate of transfers out of Guantanamo is too slow. There have only been four transfers so far during the Biden administration. Two of them were transfers that were negotiated by the Obama administration several years ago. And two of them were transfers in response to court orders. There haven't been any discretionary transfers and there haven't been any resettlements from Guantanamo in many years. Now, certainly hope and expect to see some additional transfers from Guantanamo, including, I would hope, transfers in the near future. But a transfer every six months or so from the prison is not 
an effective closure strategy. The United States government needs to do more to transfer these men out of Guantanamo. I look forward to hearing from the state about what concrete steps will be taken to increase the rate of transfers, including in particular resettlements. And in terms of the commission and what it can do to assist this process, we have outlined in our written submission a number of specific recommendations for action. And I wanna highlight one, and that is we would encourage the commission to continue to facilitate dialogue between the United States government and OAS member states toward the resettlement of detainees from Guantanamo. You know, the, the, the prior Bush administration transferred more than 500 men out of Guantanamo. The Obama administration transferred more than 200 men out of Guantanamo. And they had the support of many nations in achieving this. But the world has changed. It's not 2006, it's not 2009. And one of the greatest challenges that we face as advocates for these men in Guantanamo today is to make sure that they are not forgotten. That is to remind foreign governments that these men need urgent resettlement in many instances. And so we encourage the commission to remain involved and to work with OAS member states toward the resettlement of detainees from Guantanamo, because that is the only way to achieve the outcome that everyone here at this hearing today seeks, and that is the closure of Guantanamo. So I thank you uh, for the opportunity to address you, and I will now turn, uh, turn this over to uh, my Guantanamo colleague, Walter Ruiz. Thank you very much, uh, Wells, uh, commissioners, uh, representatives of the United States government, uh, members of CIGO and members of the public. Uh, first, let me thank you for the opportunity to come here today uh, and update you on the situation of our client, Mustafa al Hasawi. With me today are Mr. Sam Lachelier and Mr. Sean Gleason, who are my co-counsel um, in the representation of Mr. al Hasawi. Uh, again, let me reiterate uh, how much we appreciate the opportunity to come before you again uh, and talk to you about a more personal uh, situation uh, and one that perhaps gives you uh, some insight uh, into one man's particular plight uh, in Guantanamo. As our colleagues have indicated, there have been previous resolutions in two, uh, resolution 2-06 in 2-11 in 2006 and 2011, respectively. Uh, this commission focused on the uh, effect of precautionary measures and the United States government necessity to give effect to those precautionary measures. Otherwise, if not, it would lead to irreparable harm of the detainees' fundamental rights. In July 22nd of 2013, you extended the scope and stressed continuing to accord due process rights uh, to the detainees at Guantanamo Bay. In July 2015, you adopted precautionary measures in the case of our client, Mr. Mustafa al Hasawi. The commission concluded at that time that the requirement of the seriousness was met. The commission particularly focused on the deprivation of liberty, at that time, 12 years without a trial, pseudo isolation of Mr. al Hasawi and the lack of adequate and consistent medical care. Today we come before you to address you once again, seven years later. Now, Mr. al Hasawi has been in Guantanamo for 20 years without a trial. That's 20 years without due process. It is important to understand that internal government documents indicate that Mr. al Hasawi was not a detainee with a significant role in Al Qaeda. He was also not a financial mastermind. Regardless, he remains indefinitely detaining Guantanamo without a trial. At the time of Mr. Al-Hasawi's capture and rendition into the CIA black sites, he was assessed to be a healthy young male with no significant problems. He was given a number of exams, including a rectal exam that was normal. After 20 years 
of indefinite detention and confinement. Mr. al Hasawi today is a shell of a man. This man has suffered daily and continues to suffer daily. His body is a testament to the abuse he has endured. During that time, he has suffered from a rectal prolapse, tears in his anal cavity, anal stenosis, hearing loss, cervicogenic disease, severe migraines, stage two hypertension, which leads him to an increased risk of heart attack and hypertension, sacroiliac joint dysfunction, insomnia, sleep disturbance. These are only some of the ailments that Mr. Al Hasawi suffers on a daily basis. Today, however, uh, as my colleague says, we acknowledge there has been some progress. Uh, we are cautiously optimistic in Mr. Al Hasawi's case that the government, and particularly this administration, may be willing to engage in a negotiated resolution that appropriately takes into account Mr. Al Hasawi's history of abuse, of torture. It's a significant role as delineated by government documents, the various medical infirmities he suffers from, and his positive detention history. However, any such negotiated settlement must include withdrawal of the death penalty, sufficient conditions of adequate conditions of confinement, consistent medical care, access to necessary experts, as well as treatment, and a realistic path to repatriation for Mr. al Hasawi whose home country of Saudi Arabia has expressed the desire and the willingness to receive Mr. al Hasawi upon his being released from the custody of the United States government. However, in order to achieve that goal after these 20 years, the state must provide adequate terms for settlement or, in the alternative, dismiss the case entirely for violations of fundamental rights, such as Mr. al Hasawi's right to a speedy trial. In the alternative, the government should bring Mr. al Hasawi expeditiously to trial, excluding any evidence obtained or derived from torture. We encourage the Commission to continue to extend the precautionary measures and recommend to the United States to give effect to those measures and to do so by continuing to adopt the necessary measures to ensure the protection of fundamental rights and due process to adopt the necessary measures to protect the life and integrity of Mr. al Hasawi, adopt necessary measures to guarantee that detention conditions are adequate, and adopt necessary measures to ensure consistent access to medical care, including expert care, treatment, as well as appropriate services for the rehabilitation for the victims of surgery. Thank you for your time. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, this concludes our initial presentation. Muchas gracias. Hemos tomado nota de sus Thank comentarios. you very much. We've taken down note of your comments and petitions. We really think now I give the floor for 20 minutes to the state. Please go ahead. Good morning. My name is Thomas Hastings. I'm the interim permanent representative of the US mission to the Organization of American States. I'm joined today by my colleague, Jeff Kovar from the Department of State's Office of the Legal Advisor who will speak after my introduction. On behalf of the US government, uh, I'd like to thank the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for convening today's hearing. The United States supports the commission in its work to protect and promote human rights in the Western hemisphere and we recognize and we applaud the positive impact the commission has had on the laws and practices in many countries and the lives of innumerable individuals. I would also like to thank the civil society requesters for raising this important issue today. I believe it's just over seven years since we convened in this forum to discuss these issues. And we're happy to be here and to be talking with you today. We are here at the invitation of the commission to discuss US military detention operations at the U.S. Naval Station in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. We intend to provide for the commission, for those who requested this meeting, and for public viewers and the public record, pertinent information regarding the detention operations of Guantanamo. As a preliminary matter, I would like to address a few issues on the nature of this hearing. First, 
We reiterate for the Commission that given the description of the hearing in the Commission's communication and the breadth of the subject matter, the United States understands this to be a hearing of a general nature under Article 66 of the Commission's Rules of Procedure. We also note that the incoming request includes reference to a request for precautionary measures for a petition that the Commission archived in January of this year. Nevertheless, we'll share what we can in this public venue. Second, the United States also respectfully, respectfully reiterates its longstanding view that although the Commission may make recommendations for precautionary measures, the Commission's governing instruments do not give it the authority to require that states adopt precautionary measures. And as such, the United States construes the Commission's request for precautionary measures as a non-binding recommendation. And finally, the United States reiterates that the Commission's competence in reviewing the US human rights practices is limited to the non-binding American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man and does not extend to the application of treaties or other instruments. Since 2002, the United States has engaged with the Inter-American Inter Commission on Human Rights regarding our Guantanamo detention operations. We have done so as part of our shared support for transparency and the rule of law in any activities that bear on a government's respect for human rights. <clears throat> Before turning to my colleague from the Office of the Legal Advisor, I'd like to underscore the United States overall approach to the facility at Guantanamo. First, the US government has repeatedly reaffirmed its commitment to closing the detention facility at Guantanamo. And to that end, the current administration engaged in a thorough review involving all relevant departments and agencies to develop an approach for responsibly reducing the detainee population and setting the conditions to close the facility. Second, I would like to emphasize, as we have previously, that the United States is fully committed to ensuring that detains, detainees are treated humanely and are held in accordance with the law. All US military detention operations conducted in connection with armed conflict, including at Guantanamo Bay, are carried out in accordance with international humanitarian law, including common Article Three of the Geneva Conventions and all other applicable international and domestic laws. Let me now introduce Jeffrey Kovar, Assistant Legal Advisor in the Department of State's Office of the Legal Advisor. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, Madam President and um, Mr. and Madam Vice Presidents, Commissioners, members of civil society, and council, uh, thank you very much for uh, holding this hearing. Uh, uh, it's an honor to be here um, and a pleasure. Uh, I've had the opportunity to speak to, before the commission on a number of occasions over many years. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's always a pleasure. My only regret is that we're not able to be uh, in the same room. Please allow me to underscore the US government's commitment on these issues. First, by highlighting the recent appointment of Ambassador Tina Caden now as the Department of State's Special Representative for Guantanamo Affairs. Ambassador Caden now brings a wealth of diplomatic experience to leading the department's efforts to find transfer locations for Guantanamo detainees, advancing the ultimate closure of the detention facility. Ambassador Cade now asked me to convey to you her willingness to engage with the commission in the future on any remaining human rights issues you may have related to Guantanamo detainees. It's been over seven years since the commission's last public hearing on this particular thematic issue. And the United States is pleased to be able to provide the commission information regarding a number of positive developments. We will discuss each of these in more depth in just a moment. But to summarize, since 2015, which was the time of the last hearing, the United States has transferred 85 detainees consistent with our national security interests and with regard to the detainees' humane treatment after transfer. In particular, this administration has repatriated four detainees to Morocco, 
Saudi Arabia, to Algeria, and to Afghanistan. Currently, as has already been said, there are 36 detainees at Guantanamo, compared with 122 um, uh, since you had your last public hearing in 2015. There are 22 detainees who are currently approved for transfer, and the Department of State is diligently working to identify suitable transfer locations and negotiate that transfer with foreign governments. We expect to have additional transfers in the near future. The Periodic Review Board, um, which we know of as the PRB, has continued and accelerated its work of assessing whether continued detention under the law of war of certain detainees is necessary to protect against a continuing significant threat to the security of the United States. Since the PRB began its work in October of 2013, it has held full hearings and multiple file reviews for all eligible detainees. Under this administration, the PRB has expedited its schedule um, over the last two years. And in those 18 months, 16 detainees have been found transfer eligible through the PRB process that had not previously been determined to be eligible. I will be addressing today five broad categories of issues. Transfers, the PRB process and eligibility for transfer, humane treatment and detention uh, operations, detainee rights to challenge their detention in court, and the US military commissions. First, transfers. Approximately 95% of all the individuals who have been held at Guantanamo Bay facility since 2002 have been repatriated or resettled. Since the last hearing before the commission on this issue, 85 detainees have been transferred from Guantanamo to various countries, including Ghana, Italy, Kuwait, Mauritania, Montenegro, Oman, Senegal, Serbia, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Morocco, and Algeria. As noted earlier, 36 detainees remain at Guantanamo and 22 of them have been determined to be eligible for transfer. The United States continues to pursue vigorously the safe and <clears throat> transfer of all these detainees who have been designated for transfer, including through intensive diplomatic efforts in order ultimately to close the Guantanamo Bay detention facility. The PRB process and eligibility for transfer. Detainees at the Guantanamo Bay detention facility are held pursuant to US domestic statute called the 2001 Authorization for the Use of Military Force, which we refer to as the AUMF and as informed by the laws of war. The 2001 AUMF authorizes detention of individuals who were part of or substantially supported Al Qaeda or associated forces. Under the law of war, a state may detain enemy belligerents, whether they're privileged or unprivileged, without charge or trial to prevent their further participation in hostilities. In addition, Many persons detained at Guantanamo have been charged in a military commission or have pursued habeas corpus proceedings in US federal court through which they've challenged the lawfulness of their detentions. Both of these I will discuss uh, in the coming minutes. All detainees for whom criminal charges have not been brought in a military commission and who are subject to continued detention under the law of war are eligible for review by the Periodic Review Board, the PRB. The PRB is an administrative interagency body that was established by Executive Order 13567 to determine whether the detention of eligible Guantanamo detainees remains necessary to protect against a significant, a continuing significant threat to the security of the United States. Under this administration, the PRB has expedited the full review 
of all detainees during the last two years. A PRB determination that a detainee is transfer eligible does not address the legality of their continued detention. Nevertheless, once a transfer eligibility determination has been made for a detainee by the PRB and upheld by the cabinet level review committee, the United States seeks to locate a foreign country willing to repatriate or resettle the individual and provide appropriate security and humane treatment assurances. Consistent with the national security foreign policy interests of the United States, the Department of State engages in diplomatic outreach to identify suitable transfer locations for individuals at Guantanamo who are eligible for transfer. This outreach involves engaging foreign governments to request they receive a Guantanamo detainee. If a positive res response is received, then more detailed follow-on discussion occurs regarding the potential transfer undertakings. These discussions with a potential receiving government include the negotiation of a suite of security assurances, as well as humane treatment assurances. As the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken has emphasized, the department takes seriously the task of identifying countries that will respect the human rights of transferees. This includes consideration of the principle of non refoulement Under US law and policy, the humane treatment of the detainee upon his transfer from Guantanamo is a critical factor for any transfer. Consistent with Executive Order 13567, once a detainee at Guantanamo is determined to be eligible for transfer through the PRB process, the Department of State and the Department of Defense are responsible <clears throat> for ensuring that, and I quote from the executive order, vigorous efforts are undertaken to identify a suitable transfer location for any such detainee outside of the United States, consistent with the national security and foreign policy interests of the United States and the commitment set forth in section 2242A <clears throat> of the Foreign Affairs Reform and Restructuring Act of 1998, unquote. The Department of State in consultation with the Department of Defense is also responsible for obtaining appropriate security and humane treatment assurances regarding any detainee to be transferred to another country and evaluating those humane treatment assurances consistent with US government detainee transfer policies. Furthermore, under section 2242A, of the Foreign Affairs Reform and Restructuring Act of 1998. It is the policy of the United States, quote, not to expel, extradite, or otherwise effect the involuntary return of any person to a country in which there are substantial grounds for believing the person would be in danger of being subjected to torture, regardless of whether the person is physically present in the United States, end quote. Decisions with respect to Guantanamo detainees are made on a case-by-case -case basis, taking into account the particular circumstances of the transfer, the proposed receiving country, the individual's preferences, and any other concerns regarding humane treatment. Recommendations by the Department of State are decided at senior levels through a process involving department officials most familiar with international legal standards and the conditions in the country's concern. In an instance in which specific concerns about the treatment of an individual that, uh, I'm sorry, about specific concerns about the treatment an individual may receive cannot be resolved satisfactorily, we have in the past and we would in the future recommend against transfer consistent with US government policy. Humane treatment in detention operations. The United States is fully committed to ensuring that persons detained at Guantanamo are treated, are treated humanely and held in accordance with applicable law. All US military detention operations 
including those at Guantanamo Bay, must comply with all domestic laws and applicable international legal obligations. And the United States takes very seriously its responsibility to provide for the safe and humane care of detainees at Guantanamo Bay. In particular, the United States ensures that all detention operations at Guantanamo Bay comply with applicable domestic and international law, including humane treatment protections that are found in common Article Three of the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and the Convention Against Torture. Torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment are categorically prohibited under US domestic and international law, including international human rights law and the law of armed conflict. These prohibitions exist everywhere and at all times. The Joint Medical Group at Guantanamo, which we refer to as the JMG, is committed to providing appropriate and exemplary medical care to all detained individuals. JMG healthcare providers take seriously their duty to protect the physical and mental health of detained persons and approach their interactions with those individuals in a manner that encourages provider patient trust and rapport and that is aimed at encouraging participation of detained persons in medical treatment and prevention. The health care provided to detained persons at Guantanamo is comparable to that which U.S. military personnel receive while serving at Joint Task Force Guantanamo. The right to challenge the legality of detention in court. All detainees at Guantanamo have the right to challenge the lawfulness of their military detention in U.S. federal court through the petition for writ of habeas corpus. Detainees may submit written statements and provide live testimony at their hearings in federal court via video link. The United States has the burden in these cases to establish its legal authority to hold the detainees by a preponderance of the evidence. Many of the detainees in Guantanamo today have challenged their detention in US federal court. All of the detainees at Guantanamo who have prevailed under final orders that are no longer subject to appeal have either been repatriated or resettled or are in the process of being repatriated or resettled. To date, 33 detainees have received final US federal court orders requiring their release and have been transferred from Guantanamo, including a detainee transferred in June of this year. Um, with your indulgence, um, Madam uh, President, I probably have another minute and a half to speak. I could hold those remarks for our remaining time or continue now. I'm in your hands. I prefer that for después, así no lo Así no lo hace a prisa y lo puede hacer con mayor tranquilidad cuando le devolvamos la palabra. Muy bien. Muchas gracias, uh, ilustre representación. Sí, representatives of the state, you can continue with your comments on the second part of your intervention. Thank you for your understanding. Y pasamos ahora a una siguiente etapa, que es una etapa donde la comisión va a poder... Let's continue with the next stage. The commission will be able to ask some questions. Now I would like to give the floor to the second vice president of the commission, Margaret Macaulay. I would like for her to give her comments and questions. Thank you. Um... Mr. First Vice President, thank you for calling on me. Uh, good morning. I think it's still good morning. Yes, good morning, everyone. My morning is rather long. <laughs> it's been long so far. Um, uh, I, I, I thank all of you um, for being here and for your presentations this morning. I rather have a feeling of deja vu because I used to be the, the country rapporteur for the US and took part in a number of, certainly the last um, uh, um, public uh, hearing and many bilateral meetings on the issue of detainees in, in Guantanamo. Um, 
I had hoped not to be a part of any of those anymore because I I have always found it rather difficult to appreciate the fact that the, one of the most powerful the most powerful country in the world cannot find a better way of dealing with detainees in in Guantanamo, especially after the scandals of torture that went on and so on and all that was sorted out and they most of those who are there now as we've heard this morning 22 have been deemed and decided ready for um, tr um transfer uh, uh um i i find it difficult to to appreciate why the process is so slow because surely despite the fact that the u.s has to satisfy itself that wherever they are transferred to um, they will be treated humanely and not tortured and, and so on and so forth. There does come a time when the detention itself becomes inhumane. Uh, and, and I think with some of these detainees, we've long passed that period. And, and, and the um, United States, uh, with its strong belief in human rights, and the rights of people and constitutional rights and so on and due process and all this, I am sure appreciates that fact. And so I still cannot understand why there seems to be an administrative delay in the transfers because of your power. Sometimes these things can be a curse, but there you have it you're powerful enough to move faster than you are doing. Um, that, uh, um, I, I wish the US can explain specifically what the difficulty is in clearing out those who are still in Guantanamo and closing that facility, which has developed with such a bad reputation. Um, thank you. Muchas gracias, eh, Comisionada Margaret. Y quisiera... Thank you, Commissioner. Margaret, I would like to ask Commissioner Roberta Clark, um, to rapporteur, if you have any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Alon, and good um, morning to everyone, representatives of the state and representatives of civil society, as well as those in detention. I, I don't know if I could say it any more eloquently or with any further greater bemusement than my commissioner, my fellow commissioner, um, Macaulay. Um, it is, I think lamentable is a very soft word for what has happened in Guantanamo. Um, this absence of due process, this indefinite detention. It seems to me at this stage, though, without, so I don't have to repeat what has been said over the last 20 years, uh, there seems to be a difference of uh, understanding of the factual situation of some of those who are still in Guantanamo between representatives of the state and those who are representing them here. And so I wanted to ask specifically in relation to healthcare, and I want to ask Mr. Walter Ruiz, Ruiz who spoke about uh, Mr. Al. Hausawi, I think it was you who spoke about his case and uh, and uh, the the um, his low health health situation, uh, his um ill health. I was wondering, what do you have to say in response to what the representative of the state have said about the availability of quality health care? Uh, maybe could, this could be some specific response to that. And also, I would like to hear a little bit more about the right to challenge legality of detention in federal court. If this has been done by Mr. Al Al Hausawi. How are we and with, to what to what effect? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner, for the opportunity to respond uh, to those two questions. Uh, with respect to the adequacy of the medical care. Solo, perdón, perdón, uh, sorry, sorry for interrupting civil society. First, the commissioners will intervene and then the civil society will have 12 minutes to intervene. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. Now I would like to ask Commissioner Joel Hernandez if he has any questions. Thank you, 
President, I would like to thank both parties, the requesting organizations, but also the representatives of the state for your wonderful and very clear and objective interventions. Personally speaking, I now have a good understanding on the situation of those persons detained still in Guantanamo. I echo those who have expressed that it's time to close Guantanamo. Um, Mr. Dixon explained this very well. After 20 years, the intervention of the US in Afghanistan has ended. And however, there are still 36 people detained in Guantanamo Bay. And we don't understand how these people are still there. So I think that the question of Margaret May Macaulay regarding the reasons why these persons are not being transferred uh, is very important. I think that we need to have information in this regard. I also would like to focus on the current detention conditions of those 36 detainees. I'd like to know if any of those persons is in solitary confinement, if some of those people are accused of a crime that accounts for death penalty. Or I would like to note as well, which monitoring instances exist for the situation of persons deprived of their liberty in Guantanamo. I am really sorry that up to date, it has not been possible for the commission to visit the detention center, especially taking into consideration that the commission is always is available to conduct this monitoring in situ visits as we do on several occasions in other countries. I'd like to know if there has been any other monitoring instance. For example, if the Red Cross International Committee has been able to conduct any visit recently to monitor the situation of persons deprived of their liberty so that they could formulate recommendations for American authorities. That would be all on my side, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. I also would like to make some questions First, I would like to second the comments of my colleagues, especially the comments made by Commissioner Marga May Macaulay and Commissioner Roberta Clark. Regarding the violation of due process of law and the conditions that are against human rights, and that because of these reasons, the Commission has recommended the closure of Guantanamo Bay, which has not been conducted right now. And I have questions for the state. We would like to know if there is the necessary medical care to address those diseases that derive from the aging of the population. That is one of the questions that I have for you. And I have another question. That is, what is the situation of those detainees whose transfer has not been approved and who have not been accused of any crime. I would like to know about their situation, their status. Um, the other question that I have has to do with whether there is any schedule for the closure of Guantanamo Bay. I would like to know if it's an expectation, an aspiration, or if there is a specific mechanism to have real expectations to know that the closure of Guantanamo is actually feasible. That is, those are my questions. Now we will When we will finish the intervention of the commission. And now I'd like to give the floor both to civil society organizations and to the representatives of the state. And since civil society organizations did not use the time allotted, you have 12 minutes. So now 
you will be able to intervene for up to 15 minutes. That's the time you have now. You can see the timer on the screen. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, in order to organize our response, I will give the floor first to Wells Dixon to give some general remarks, um, then to Walter Ruiz to, to answer those questions uh, relating to the condition of, of Mr. Al Hasawi. Um, and then I will close. So uh, over to you, Wells. Thank you. And thank you again to the commission and to the state and to the public uh, for this opportunity. Um, I'm happy to answer any specific questions, but I do want to say uh, uh, as an initial matter that, again, we appreciate the, re the renewed commitment of the Biden administration to closing the prison at Guantanamo. We appreciate the appointment of Ambassador Caden now at the State Department. That is a positive development, um, uh, and we look forward to working with her and her team. And uh, uh, I was pleased as well to hear that uh, that there may be transfers uh, in the near future. Um, but with great respect, um, a lot of what we heard today was not new. I mean, we heard objections to the Commission's jurisdiction over these issues, which we've heard for the last 20 years and the commission resolved, I think more than a decade ago. Um, we also heard a lot about legal authority to detain the men at Guantanamo. Um, we certainly don't agree with uh, the interpretations of the state about that authority. Um, I note uh, that, that the United States government continues to deny the men at Guantanamo basic constitutional due process rights. Uh, and, and as the commissioner pointed out, uh, if nothing else, this is inhumane. The continuing detention of these men is inhumane. But equally fundamentally, it really makes no sense. I mean, I, 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 I have to point out that for the state to continue to talk about the legal basis for detaining men who the government has decided should not be detained in a prison that the president of the United States has said should be closed makes absolutely no sense. It makes no sense as a matter of law or as a matter of policy. You know, what I, what I didn't hear today and, and what I hope to hear today was the concrete steps that the United States government is going to take to increase the rate of transfers. You know, we know what the transfer policy is. What we don't know is how that's going to translate into transfers. We haven't heard anything about how the United States government intends to end the military commission process or ultimately close the prison. And so I once again uh, ask the commission to continue to facilitate dialogue with OAS member states toward the resettlement of detainees from Guantanamo because that is a concrete step that is going to affect the rate of transfer and ultimately close the prison. But I do wanna make one note uh, with respect to the issue of the health of the detainees, because I think it underscores what's at stake by continuing to hold these men. There was an incident last week involving a client of mine at Guantanamo who had a medical emergency and had to be hospitalized at Guantanamo. You know, the United States didn't tell us this initially. And they have no long term plan of care for men like this. Men who are approved for transfer but continue to be detained in ill health. I mean, it's, it's unacceptable. It's unconscionable with, with the utmost respect to the state. So, with that, I will turn it over to, to my colleague, Walter Ruiz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dixon. Uh, Commissioner Clark, in response to your two questions, first with respect to medical care, must respectfully disagree uh, with the representative of the U.S. government that the general comments made reflect the situation uh, on the ground. Uh, the adequacy of medical care uh, in Guantanamo uh, is not uh, is substandard. Uh, in particular, um, access to qualified experts uh, that can provide uh, care. Uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, as well as the uh, access to uh, specialized 
uh, machinery necessary uh, for such care. One, one such example would be, for instance, uh, the lack of an MRI machine, uh, which has not only impacted the ability to provide adequate uh, testing uh, for the men in Guantanamo, but also has impacted the progress uh, of the ongoing hearings uh, in the military commissions. The continuity of care uh, is absolutely lacking. Uh, continuity of care is essential uh, in the care of uh, prolonged detention uh, in a detainee population such as this. We've seen that model in The Hague where they have uh, internal doctors who have been at the facility um, for a very lengthy time and over 20 years. Part of the problem that detainees face like Mr. al Hasawi, is that every time a new doctor comes in, which tends to be every six to seven months, they have to relearn decades long worth of medical history. Uh, and this impacts the adequacy of the care that they're able to provide for the six or seven months, or maybe at times a year uh, that they're on the ground. So the adequacy and the consistency of the medical care uh, is woefully lacking. And I echo uh, Mr. Dixon's comments in terms of the inadequacy uh, of plan in place for an aging population. Mr. al Hasawi is 54 years of age, and as I related earlier, has a number of medical ailments. Um, and there is no there is no proper plan in place uh, to provide medical care for the detainees on long-term basis. Uh, finally, I will tell you that Mr. al Hasawi has challenged his detention in habeas. However, uh, to Commissioner Hernandez's point, Mr. al Hasawi is one of six men who remain charged with the death penalty. Uh, and Mr. al Hasawi has been charged with the death penalty um, since uh, he was first brought before a court in 2008. And as I mentioned, uh, he has been now 20 years uh, without a trial. Uh, in terms of the monitoring situation, um, in terms of uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross, I'll tell Commissioner Hernandez that the International Committee of the Red Cross does have periodic uh, contact with Mr. al Hasawi. They have facilitated video, te video teleconferencing uh, with his family, but this came after decades of litigation uh, to provide that adequacy of, uh, of access as well as the ability to contact uh, family uh, in Mr. al Hasawi's case in Saudi Arabia. So the ICRC does have uh, the ability and the consistency in monitoring. Uh, we do not, however, have access to their recommendations to the government. Uh, and with that, I, I will uh, turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Uh, Carlin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, in uh, these closing minutes, uh, I'd like to make a couple of points related to uh, the reasons that Guantanamo is, is has not been closed to date. Um, a, just a brief note about humane treatment and then talk a little bit about our requests to the commission. Um, So in terms of the reasons for non-closure of the prison, um, there are, are maybe, maybe a way to think about it just two broad buckets. The first is the failure to transfer those detainees who are cleared for transfer yet have not been removed from the prison um, and sent either to their home countries or to a third country. The second is the failure to conclude the military commissions and the failure to, uh, for the, United States to state unambiguously that Guantanamo detainees are entitled to due process. The United States continues to sustain in court as recently as last year uh, that Guantanamo detainees do not have full due process rights despite decades at this point of federal constitutional litigation on the point. Um, and so for those detainees who are not in the group of 22 who are cleared for transfer and who remain subject to uh, trial or charges, the failure to conclude the military commission system uh, remains a fundamental barrier to the closure of Guantanamo. The commission has previously found in its thematic report and, um, and I believe in the MSCN report that a less return, restrictive alternative exists, which would be to try these men in federal court. In practice, probably the most uh, practical way that these cases will conclude is through plea, neg plea negotiations, but it is necessary to move forward in some direction in order to expeditiously end uh, this issue as well that will allow the, the closure of Guantanamo. Um, in terms of 
uh, humane treatment. Uh, my colleagues have, have covered that issue quite well in the availability of medical care, but it's also important to note that the ultimate response to this question has to be the closure and transfer of the detainees. Um, and that that's really what is fundamentally at stake today. Um, in specific response to Commissioner Rallon's question about the situation of the three indefinite detainees who have neither been charged nor cleared for transfer, uh, their situation today is that they have formal access to the writ of habeas corpus, and that is the only legal alternative available to them to challenge their detention. But they sit, they continue to sit in a legal limbo in a prison that for 20 years has purported itself to be outside of the bounds of the law, national, international, um, that, that that purports to, to hold them in, in a different status from, from anybody else. Uh, and so what are we requesting from the commission today? First, uh, in terms of what we see as necessary steps by the US government, it must comply with its international obligations regarding the Guantanamo Bay precautionary measures, which includes first, the expeditious closure of the detention center at Guantanamo Bay. Second, guaranteeing defendants rights to due process and judicial guarantees. Um, this is the, the point I mentioned about the United States continued failure to, um, to, to agree or to argue that, that uh, Guantanamo detainees have due process rights. And third, accelerating detainee transfers to their countries of origin or third countries where um, is always ensuring the, the guarantees of non refoulement And here again, the commission has an important role to play um, if it can in any way facilitate uh, conversations with other OAS countries who may be willing to accept detainees. OAS countries have an important role to play um, in if they are able to accept detainees and helping to uh, ensure that this prison is closed expeditiously. Um, and finally, we request the, that the Inter-American Commission issue a follow-up resolution on these precautionary measures. Uh, the commission has a, in the past issued multiple follow-up resolutions since the initial resolution in 2002. Um, this precautionary measure was in fact a, a, a pioneering precautionary measure in the use of these follow-up resolutions. Uh, and today it is necessary for the commission to reevaluate uh, the situation at Guantanamo Bay in light of the long time that has passed, in light of uh, in the intervening years having published a thematic report and a merits report that make conclusive uh, legal determinations about um, what goes on at Guantanamo Bay. And in, in light of the current situation, which is uh, all, all sides uh, represented here at the hearing today, uh, acknowledge is different than it was uh, seven years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, and with that, uh, unless uh, my fellow representatives have anything else that they would like to briefly add, I think we will conclude here. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, um, Ms. Corwin. I just, just briefly, um, given, given the reality um, of Guantanamo and from an individual representative perspective, the one observation I would make to uh, the government is that uh, since the reality is that this has been such a lengthy process, um, and with all due candor, um, I do not hold a great deal of hope for uh, an immediate or recent closure of Guantanamo, there must be an emphasis on the continued conditions of confinement, and the adequacy of their care, um, and on ensuring that as long as there is prolonged detention for people such as Mr. al Hasawi, that those conditions are adequate uh, and in accordance with standards for uh, international law and domestic law. Thank you so much. Perhaps if I could make one more observation with regard to the three individuals who are neither charged nor proof for transfer, I think it's no coincidence that those three individuals are all victims of the CIA torture program. Uh, and I suspect that that has more to do uh, with the fact that they're neither charged nor approved for transfer than it does with anything that they may have uh, allegedly done um, 10 or 20 years ago. Okay, thank you very much. I thank the comments from the so uh, civil society. 
now we'll give the floor to the states in the last seconds of the first intervention. Uh, there was a consultation to add up one minute and a half. There was uh, an interruption and he could not use the whole of his time. So initially um, he had uh, 12 minutes, but we will hear him up to 13 minutes and a half so that he can compensate for that time. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and thanks very much for the uh, very thoughtful questions and, and, and the comments um, by civil society, uh, including uh, answering, uh, I think, many of the factual questions, some of the factual questions that were asked. Let me return to uh, our original prepared statement. Um, uh, the last point that we wanted to talk about was the military commission proceedings. I think this will also help answer some of the questions that have been asked. Alongside our federal courts, military commissions are an appropriate venue for prosecuting Guantanamo detainees for, for alleged crimes. The US government remains of the view that in our efforts to protect US national security, the military commissions and federal courts can, depending on the circumstances of the specific prosecution, each provide tools that are both effective and legitimate. All current military commission proceedings at Guantanamo incorporate fundamental procedural guarantees that meet or exceed the fair trial safeguards required by common Article III of the Geneva Conventions and other applicable law and are consistent with those in additional Protocol II to the Geneva Conventions as well. These include, one, the presumption of innocence and the requirement that the prosecution prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Two, the prohibition of the admission of any statement obtained by the use of torture or by cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment in military commission proceedings, except against a person accused of torture or such treatment as evidence that the statement was made. Three, latitude for the accused in selecting defense counsel. Four, in capital cases, and I think Mr. El Hassawi's uh, counsel has identified that um, he's being charged with capital crimes. In capital cases, the right of the accused to counsel, quote, learned in applicable law related to capital cases, unquote. And five, the right of the accused to pretrial discovery of information relevant to his defense. The 2009 Military Commissions Act also provides for the right to appeal final judgments rendered by a military commission to the U.S. Court of Military Commission Review and to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, the latter of which is a federal civilian court consisting of life tenure judges, and then ultimately to the United States Supreme Court. Now, commission proceedings were paused during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, but those proceedings have resumed in 2021 and remain ongoing. On October 29th, 2021, Military Commission's defendant Majid Khan was sentenced following a one-day hearing before a jury. Mr. Khan completed his sentence in March of this year, and the US government is vigorously working to identify and negotiate a third country resettlement for him. Let me, if I may, um, try to answer um, uh, at least briefly uh, some of the questions that have been asked. I think one question that's come up from um, perhaps all of the commissioners is why is it so slow uh, if, uh, if the policy desire is to close Guantanamo and to transfer detainees who are eligible? Um, it's a complex process. It's a very difficult process. And ultimately, um, the United States has to find other states that are willing uh, to repatriate or resettle the Guantanamo detainees. And um, that's not easy, um, but we're making every effort uh, to do so. Um, uh, Mr. Hernandez, uh, Commissioner Hernandez asked, um, about the living conditions of detainees at Guantanamo. Um, 
the living conditions are communal. So um, the, um, the detainees live together and can cook together and so on. Um, um, he also asked about monitoring and I think that question was answered. The ICRC has, had, has long had regular access to um, all the detainees uh, at Guantanamo. And we're in regular dialogue with the ICRC about um, its um, uh, about its monitoring. Um, um, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Commissioner Nayon uh, asked about um, medical care. The JMG, which we talked about, the, the Joint Medical Group, administers care to all detainees at Guantanamo, including psychiatric services and care specific to a detainee's age group. Detainees are treated at dedicated medical facilities with an expert medical staff. The medical facilities are equipped with inpatient beds, a physical therapy area, an audiology booth, optometry exam room, dental treatment suites, an operating room, a pharmacy, a radiology unit, and a central sterilization area. Navy hospital corpsmen visit each cell block daily Upon the request of any detainee for care, these corpsmen can refer them to primary care providers in the JMG. In addition to providing routine medical care on a 24 hour, seven day basis, more serious medical conditions can be treated at US Naval Hospital Guantanamo, which provides care to US service members at the base. Additional specialists and equipment are available from outside the base to provide care at Guantanamo for medical needs that exceed the capabilities of U.S. Naval Hospital at Guantanamo. The U.S. recognizes that there are unique challenges associated with an aging detainee population and all detainees are afforded medical and psychiatric care appropriate for an aging population. Um, um, Ms. Kerwin also um, asked about, or made some statements about uh, due process and whether it applies in um, Guantanamo and uh, made a statement about the US position on that, which I think was a little bit inaccurate. Um, the question of whether due process uh, under the US constitution applies to detainees at Guantanamo is currently being litigated in US federal court before the uh, en banc US Court of Appeals the District of Columbia. In our July 2021 filing, the US government did not continue to rely on the prior administration's argument that due process cannot apply at Guantanamo, but argued that the court need not determine that question um, because um, Mr. Uh, El, uh, Al Hala's um, specific due process claims do not need to be reached since He's already receiving all of the um, all of the protections that would be available if due process did apply. The oral argument before the full court sitting in Bank was held uh, about a year ago, actually, and we're awaiting the final ruling, which of course will be publicly available, uh, including to the commission. Um, uh, Commissioner Ryan also asked about whether there's a specific schedule for closing Guantanamo, and uh, there's not. Um, we're doing our best. We're moving uh, as quickly and as vigorously as we can, but it's, uh, it's not an easy process. And with that, if I may turn it back over to, um, uh, to Mr. Hastings, um, uh, he may have some final words uh, before we close. Thank you. Thank you. I will close just very briefly. We do hope that the information that we've provided here today has been helpful to the commission to gain a more complete understanding of the current situation at Guantanamo and of our government's continuing efforts to set the conditions that can allow for the closure of the facility. The, US States, the United States will continue in our efforts both with this commission and more broadly to be transparent about our detention operations at Guantanamo including in explaining specific practices and policies and the situation of those individuals who are still detained. 
and we will also seek to respond promptly to any individual petitions reached, received on behalf of detainees at Guantanamo. We again thank you for the opportunity to present this information here for you today. Muchas gracias a la ilustre representación del Estado por. Thank you to the honorable representatives of the state for sharing your answers, your comments. We are writing down them. We are reaching the end of the hearing. And before closing it, I'd like to ask my colleagues if they would like to add any comments or if they have any specific intervention. And if not, I just would like to thank you for being here, for participating, for being here today. I think it's been a rather comprehensive hearing to have a better understanding on the current situation of Guantanamo Bay. And that the commission is monitoring the situation of human rights because I'm really we are really concerned that there are still violations of inter-American and international standards in the area of human rights. We hope that this schedule or roadmap that is no longer there, that is not there yet, can be built, can be drafted. We hope that this is a goal of the state and that the state sees this the same way and we would like to say that the commission can pre provide support and assistance in the drafting of said roadmap. So we will continue monitoring this situation. With further ado, I would like to reiterate our appreciation and I would like to adjourn this hearing. Thank you so much for being here. Regards. Thank you very much, everyone. And from me, thank you and have a good weekend.